Hey, welcome back, everyone. So last time we talked about, um, we kind of finished the backpropagation for multi-layer perceptrons. We computed the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to um, a row of the a row of any layer of the weights. So a row of the weights of any layer. And then um, afterwards, basically we said, okay, so if you can compute this gradient. That means we can apply gradient-based optimization methods in order to optimize the loss function. <coughs> then we went to a neural network playground um, by TensorFlow to visualize a simple multi-layer perceptron for a few different data sets. So again, I really encourage you guys to play around on there yourself. And next, we did a bunch of math to talk about the gradient issues in training MLPs. Basically, when we have multi-layer perceptrons with many, many layers, um, it's actually often easy to get into cases involving exploding and vanishing gradients. We talked about some ways of alleviating these issues, and those included weight initialization, weight decay, um, which is basically L2 regularization, and also layer normalization. So today we're going to talk about another way to alleviate gradient issues in MLPs. Um, but first, I just want to note one interesting fact uh, about MLPs. Uh, well, the fact is that they're not convex. And it turns out that it's not so hard to show this. So remember that the derivative or the gradient of L with respect to one row of weights in the first layer is equal to this expression over here. So notice that while well, we have we have some some known matrix here, and then if we um, if we have done a forward pass, then this would be a bunch of known matrices involving a diagonal G prime, and then here we have a bunch of W L matrices. So these are actually the unknowns that we're trying to optimize. Initially, we need to set all the, all of the weights to some initial value. Um, let's consider setting all of these weights to zero. Well, because we're multiplying this whole thing out, um, if you plug in zero over here, you just get that the gradient equals to zero. And you can easily show that even if you take the gradient of L with respect to any of the other weights, the result will actually be zero if you initialize all the weights to zero. So this means that um, having all the weights to zero, um, setting all the weights to zero actually gives us a critical point of L. So a critical point is basically where the gradient is zero. Okay, but but if all the weights are zero, then your neural network is basically always outputting zeros, right? So that can can't possibly be a good um, set of parameters. So we know that when we train many of these multi-layer perceptrons, we can get much better predictions than simply always returning zero. So, so basically then we have a critical point, which is all the weights being zero. That is not a global, uh, that is not a global minimum. And by the way, um, this is a critical, critical point, regardless of the training data and the loss function. So because of this, um, we have a local, we have a critical point, which is not a local, which is not a global minimum. Um, therefore the function, the loss function cannot be convex. So this means that if we apply gradient-based methods, well, first of all, we can only use these methods, or these, we're kind of limited in our options. And some of the better options include the different gradient-based methods that we, that we learned about for iteratively optimizing the loss function. But even when we use those, we have seen that when the, when the objective function is not convex, we can get stuck in a local minimum. Okay, so, well, there's not really a good general way around this. Um, so I guess we have to live with that, right? So sometimes some like one common trick is actually to initialize the weights um, at many different random points, apply some descent method from each point, and then after convergence of all of those, um, after convergence, we would take the best set of parameters that we obtain using each of those starting points as initialization. Okay, anyway, um, 
for now. We're not really going to get too much into that. We just want to visualize some contours of some random slices of the loss function. So basically, the loss function is actually a function of many, many, many different variables, right? It's a function of all the weights. So here, we're basically picking um, a bunch of uh, random weights. And then we're visualizing the slice of the loss function as a function of those uh, selected pairs of weights. Okay, so you can kind of see that the contours themselves aren't, aren't really convex. So if a function is convex, it turns out that the contours of the functions must also be convex shapes. So you can see that uh, these, uh, these contours are definitely not convex. In some contours, you can also see two different local optimum, for example, here and here, and also maybe here and here, for example. So this is basically just to show you that, um, I guess to make a simple mathematical argument to show that the loss function, um, the square loss involving a multilayer perceptron is not a convex loss function. And then also to visualize the non-convexity a little bit as well. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about another way to alleviate some gradient uh, exploding gradient issues. So, so remember that um, this is a two norm of the gradient of L with respect to a row of weights, right? So we basically have this uh, two norm upper bounded by a bunch of uh, sigma one one. So the maximum singular values of many of these matrices. So remember that uh, exploding gradients are more likely to occur when we use a non-saturating function, such as the ReLU or the soft plus. So um, if, we, if we do that, then G prime is likely to have a comparatively large singular value. So for example, if, Z, if some of these Zs are very, very far, very, very positive, then G prime of Z would be actually one, right? So these could be large. However, these weights could be small, especially if we use something like weight decay or L2 regularization. So even, even though sigma 1, 1 of this matrix might be large, these might be small. So overall, we can actually, um, we actually may not have any exploding gradients. Actually, we, can, we have the opposite problem. Um, we could still have vanishing gradients, even if we use these non-saturating activation functions. So residual connections are basically a way to alleviate this issue. Okay, so let's continue talking about this on the written notes. Uh, let's, let's, let's do a simple example uh, of the multilayer perceptron where y hat equals um, W2 psi of W1 psi of W0 x. Okay, I think that the brackets should be correct. So this is actually um, a two layer MLP. Let's see what happens when we use uh, when we use a pretty special W1. So suppose W1. Okay, sorry. Before that, I forgot to mention that. Um, so remember, we had the convention where n0 is the number of elements of x. And then actually, we have the convention up here. Okay, up So N0 is the dimension of X. And then this part, H1, has N1 elements. And then H2 has N2 elements. Sorry about that. 
Now let me get rid of this. So H2 has N2 elements. So suppose that um, suppose that N2 is greater than or equal to N1 and also greater than or equal to N0. So basically every time we go through a layer, the hidden layer will have more elements. And then we're going to suppose that W1 equals to this matrix, which is going to be a bunch of ones on the diagonal. A column of zeros so we have one part which is a square part up here so I'm just drawing this line to kind of separate to to show the matrix blocks so on the upper left we have a diagonal matrix with all ones so that's the identity matrix to the right of that we have a column of zeros and then below that we also have a column of zeros at the bottom left block we basically have all zeros. Okay. So first, uh, note that the number of columns of W1 must be must be equal to the number of inputs it has. So that's going to equal to N1. And then the number of columns it's going to uh, the number of rows is going to equal to n2 n2 minus 1 right because uh, we get the pre activations from multiplying by w1 so now what happens um, so now what happens when we multiply this uh, this form of the nlp out so now what happens when we multiply this form of the mlp out um, assuming this particular w1 so let's work that out So remember that psi of w0 x is actually going to equal to, well, that's equal to h1, which is equal to g prime, uh, no prime. G prime of that one, uh, G of that one, G of that two, all the way down to G of Z and one minus one, and then finally a one at the end. So what? So now, what happens when you when you multiply W one by H one? So, well, that's going to be basically this diagonal matrix. Multiplied by H1. Okay, I guess I will cut. I will cut the bracket a bit short here because because the number of elements of H one should be the same as the number of columns of this matrix. So what does that equal? Okay, so let's divide these things. So that was a bit more like the background. Okay, so what do we have here? In the first row, we're just gonna get G Z one. Right, we go along the row down a column. The only thing that will show up is going to be g of z one times one. Everything else is going to be zero. And similarly for the second, if we go along the second row and down the vector h one, we're just going to get g of z two, and so on. And note that the one, because we have a because a because the last column. Uh, sorry, this should be a this should be a one here, and then the bottom stuff is all zero. Because of this column of zero over here, 
the one will never actually appear because um, the column of zero will multiply, will always be the element that, that multiplies the one when we do the matrix multiplication. So this whole thing is going to go down all the way to Z, uh, G of Z, N1 minus 1. Okay. And then you're going to have a bunch of zeros and, until the end. So now if if G if G of Z equal let's just use a ReLU activation, right? If that equals to maximum of Z and zero, then W one H one would be equal to max of Z one with zero, max of Z two with zero, and so on all the way to max of z n1 minus 1 with 0. And then you're going to get a bunch of zeros at the end. Now we're going to use a shorthand and write this as max of z1 with 0 for the first however many components, so for the first z1, uh, for this, for the first zn minus 1, sorry, zn1 minus 1 is confusing, <laughs> components. And then we're going to write some, I guess, uh, vector notation here. So this is kind of like, yeah, kind of like the element-wise application of the ReLU, <coughs> of the ReLU activation. So that covers the upper part. And now the lower part, we're going to write that as a vector of zeros. OK. So let's continue. Continue um, calculating what the y output will be, would be if we picked this particular value of w1. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is to calculate psi of um, sorry, I, I, think, I, I guess I'll do one more step here. This is really max of W0x0, just to write out explicitly what Z is, what Z1 is. Okay. So now we're going to we're going to apply the activation to this particular function. So what is Psi of W1h1? So that's going to be Psi of what we had before. So basically a vector in block form with the upper block being max of w0 x and 0 and then the lower lower block being 0, the 0 vector. So that's going to equal to, well when we apply the psi function we basically We'll apply max with zero for every component of the of the input, and then we're going to append a one at the end. So, so this is going to be so max of the first block element wise. So this is the first block with zero. So I'm basically saying that this thing goes here and then we take the max of that with zero. And then we take this zero, put it here and then do the max of that with zero. And finally, we append a one, a scalar one at the end. And this will simplify a little bit. Yeah, sorry with this new computer, it's kind of hard, like, uh, the screen keeps moving when I put my hand down. Okay, so let's look at this part. So if we look at the max of uh, W0x with 0, this thing which I boxed is always going to be non-negative. Because while you take something, you take the maximum of something with zero, that's always going to be non-negative. 
So for example, if W0x has some positive components, then the maximum would give you the positive value. If W0x gives you something negative, then the maximum of that with zero would give you zero, right? So this is always non-negative. So on the outside, we're taking the maximum of something non-negative with zero. Well, that means that the zero will never be the maximum. The maximum between something that is non-negative and zero would be that thing that is non-negative. So we can write that down. So we so the outermost max with zero is kind of redundant. Okay, the second part, while well, you're taking the maximum of zero and zero, well, that's just zero. And lastly, the one will stay as it is. Okay, so finally, we can calculate y hat equals w2 psi of w1 psi of w0 x where we know we already know everything here right we know everything after w2 so it's going to be w2 times max of w0x with 0 and then a vector 0 and then a 1 okay so now we can let because we're taking a matrix W2 multiplying by a, a vector, which is in block form, let's also divide up W2 into the same block form. So let's, let's just write it as a left block, which corresponds to uh, the left block W2 prime, which corresponds to the first block of the vector. And then we have W2 prime prime, which corresponds to zero. And then a, and then a B2 which is going to correspond to the one. Then y hat will actually be w2 prime, w2 prime prime, b2 times max of w0x, zero, zero, zero and one. If you multiply this out, you actually get w2 prime max of w0x and zero. Okay, the second part is w2 prime prime times zero, that gives you zero. And the third part is gonna be b2 times one, that gives you b2. So this is actually the same as if I just use the block notation again, but in the other direction, let's call w2 prime and b2 as one matrix and that actually gets multiplied by max of zero max of w zero x comma zero with a one at the bottom okay but but now now this thing we said earlier that thing is actually over here right And then when you append a one, so this is like G of Z one. When you append a one to that, the whole thing becomes H one, which is basically equal to Psi of W zero X. So that means our Y hat actually becomes, and we can define this to be W two tilde it becomes just, I mean, it's just a matrix, W2 tilde times psi of zero, uh, W0 times x. So uh, kind of a, a lot of confusing calculation here, but the point is that if you compare what we started with here and what we have here, what we see is that we started with a uh, neural network with two hidden layers, but if we pick if we pick a W1 to be of this form over here, then it turns out that effectively we're, we, only have a, we only have a neural network with one layer, one hidden layer. The W1 kind of disappears 
and we're kind of directly multiplying some other matrix W tilde 2 times H1 over here. So now going back to the slide, in general we have, um, let's assume that we have this multi-layer perceptron where the hidden layers closer to the output have higher dimensions. Okay, and then we're going to assume that the activation function is ReLU. So basically what we have really shown is that a shallow neural network is actually a special case of a deep neural network. And the way we showed this was to pick a particular, um, to pick a particular weight matrix, in this case uh, using the three layer MLP, um, so two hidden layers, uh, where we pick W1 to be of this form with an identity matrix on the upper left and then zeros everywhere else. We worked through these calculations. So for, for example, we had W1 times H1, which is psi of W0x. That basically gave us the activation function applied to Z, Z1 over here. So that's w, uh, W0x. Max of that with zero, and then we have a bunch of zeros at the end, right? Because the bottom few rows are gonna be zeros. So then we continued, we, we applied the next thing, which is the psi function applied to that well that's going to give us a max between each of these blocks with zero right so this appears over here maxed with zero and then the zero gets maxed with zero and then a one at the end and then we said that because this inner max is always non-negative the ultra max is basically not doing anything um, is the maximum of something non-negative with zero. So that's just going to be the non-negative part. Max with zero, max zero with zero. Well, that's zero. And then we have a one at the end. So finally, um, finally we take W2 and then multiply by this whole thing, which is the remaining part of the model. And because we have three blocks here, we also broke down W2 into three corresponding blocks. And then when we multiply them out, we get W2 prime max of W0x comma zero plus B2. Um, the W2 prime prime term never shows up because of the zero here. Collecting the W2 prime and B2 into a single matrix, we can see that it's basically a matrix W2 tilde multiplied by psi of W0x. So we kind of skipped over one layer of the network if we choose this special case for the W1 matrix. Okay, so one thing to note is that this matrix uh, actually has a singular value of one. Why? Well, W1 and also W1 transpose is already its own SVD. Because you can imagine that there's an identity matrix on the left and on the right. So if you put two identity matrices on the left and right, we would basically form the U and V matrices. And the requirement for those are that they're orthonormal matrices and the identity matrix is already orthonormal. So in general, when you have a diagonal form like this, this is already the SVD of the matrix and you can simply read off the singular values. So they're gonna be one, 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 and then zero. The largest single value, sigma 1, 1 of W1 transpose is actually equal to 1. So if you have a so if you have a bunch of matrices that have the form of W1, then if we go back to this mod, this product, then many of these terms will not become very small. And when you when you multiply them together, um, they will be m much larger than if many of these terms are going to be small. So this would basically prevent us from getting, at least the resulting norm of the gradient will be a bit larger at least. Okay, well the problem here is that on the previous slide we have chosen W1 to be exactly this. but in reality, when we train the network, W1 is going to be some random numbers initially, and then we're going to be training W1. So it's pretty difficult to ensure that sigma 1, 1 of W1 transpose is always going to be close to 1 throughout the training process.
So how do we get around that? There are two simple options. Uh, the first option is to set W1 transpose manually. So we're just going to set W1 to be equal to this. And then we won't even train that part. Right? Okay, so sometimes this is actually kind of useful and it's uh, useful for debugging especially. But if you're going to do this from a theoretical perspective, then you may as well just use a shallower neural network, right? What's the point of writing the network out as if it's ha as if it's deeper, but then in reality is really a more shallow network. So in, in, in that case, why don't we just begin with a shallower network? Okay, so that one doesn't make as much sense. Um, what makes a lot of sense is, is actually reparameterizing the neural network so that even when W1 is close to zero, the gradient would not vanish. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at this next, um, probably a bit more slowly on the written notes. Okay, so, so originally we had y hat equals w2 times psi of w1 psi of w0 x. So this is originally. So now we're gonna change it a little bit now. It will be y hat equals w2 psi of Okay, you're going to leave a bit more room here of psi something times psi of w0x. And that something is going to be what I'm calling w1 prime plus j. So, so this whole thing is supposed to be w1. And j is going to be this matrix that we looked at with a with an identity, uh, sorry about that, that should not be a zero, with an identity on the upper left, a column of zeros, and then another block of zeros. Okay, so that's what this J is. From two slides ago, and also from here, we have shown that, so let's see. So when we first multiplied W1H1, um, we actually got, we actually got this part uh, over here on the right, right? So note that J times psi of w0x equals to max of w0x in the first block and then a zero at the bottom. Okay, so then this thing equals to w2 psi of w1 prime psi of w0 x plus plus j times psi of w0 x which is going to be the same as this thing on the right over here max of w0 x and then a zero okay close brackets so effectively, we basically have that instead of directly multiplying by, so as originally, we, we took some weight matrix multiplied by this uh, H1 over here, right? So here, we take some matrix W1 prime. Well, we're calling it W1 prime, but it's just some matrix that, we, that we, we're going to train. That multiplied by H1 plus this thing, which is basically H1, right? So not quite, if there's a one for H1. Uh, so, so the first part looks like H1, right? We have the max of W0X 
if we had a one here, then it would basically be um, this part would just be h one concatenated with zero, right? So maybe I'll write it below. So this looks like h one concatenated with the zero vector, right? The only thing we really need to have is a one in the middle here. But I think, I mean, I think that's just details, right? If we really wanted a one there, then if we went came back up here, um, we just wanted the one over here, right? So the way we would get that is basically to um, to to make our diagonal matrix have another one over here, and then that one would multiply by this uh, one, this one over here, and then that would give us the one on the right side. So that would give us basically H stacked on top with the zero matrix. Okay, so basically what we have here is that. Previously, it used to be y hat equals w2 psi of some weight matrix w1 prime, which is what we're calling it now, h1 plus h1. So previously, we only had the first part, w1 prime h1. Now we're going to add h1 and then 0. So put it another way. So this thing, which we applied the function psi to, that used to be z2. So z2 used to be this, and now we're basically making z2 equal to this in the re-parameterized network. In general, so okay. So to summarize, right, before z2 equals w1h1. But now we're saying, okay, how about Z2 equals W1, H1. I'm not really going to bother with the prime now because it's just a matrix, right? Before I had a prime in order to differentiate it with the, or the original W1. But we have made the original W1, W1 prime plus J here. Um, but I think now, now that you see, now that you have seen the steps, basically what we're, do what we're doing now is to say that Z2 equals W1, H1 plus um, plus h1 stacked up with 0, right? So that's what we see. Th that's what we have now. So in general, we basically have some layer ZL equals w well, it could be L minus one like we had here, but in general, we could make it L minus two, L minus three if we want, right? So in general, it could be L prime, H L prime plus W, sorry, we already wrote this part. Plus HL prime stacked with zero. So that will be the general form. So basically what we're doing is that for the first part to calculate Z, we're gonna take one of the previous layers and then that's normally what Z2 would be in the example, right? But now we're going to add on an H1, which is un which is not multiplied by W1. So it's, it's kind of like H1 is taking a shortcut to get multiplied by w2 or to get act to to be applied to, uh, to be kind of put into psi and then multiply by w2 in the general case we would have z of some layer l um, equal to kind of the normal looking thing the normal looking thing here um, wl prime hl prime so basically um, from some previous layer L prime, but now we're adding on the second part, which is H L prime becoming Z L becoming part of Z L without being multiplied by W L prime. Um, actually, um, we have a choice here, so we can let Z L be equal to this, and we could also let H L equals to the same thing as well, right? So. So basically, we can decide whether we want to 
apply the activation or not. Okay, so um, the other thing we can do is to decide on um, the second part, which does not pass through the activation. Uh, that can either be plus HL stacked with zero or actually ZL stacked with zero as well. So the other two versions that you may commonly see would be something like this. Okay, that's for ZL, and then you, you could do the same thing for HL. So there are some variations, but the, uh, but the primary idea is that instead of the common, I instead of the typical W times the previous hidden layer, we're going to add on one part that does not go through W to get to uh, layer L. Let's look at all of this on the slides again. So basically, um, we're going to define W1 prime to be W1 minus this J matrix that we had. So basically, um, our W1 is going to be, uh, one part of it will be kind of just a normal weight matrix, W1 prime. And then the other part will be the J matrix here. With this reparameterization re of W1, our multi-layer perceptron, in this case, just a three-layer multi-layer perceptron, is going to be y, uh, y hat equals w2 psi of w1 psi of w0 x. So expanding out the w1 part into w1 prime plus j, um, this is what we have. And then we can kind of multiply um, the w1 prime plus j out so that inside the outermost psi function we have w1 prime times psi of w0 x this is kind of the how how things are normally right x gets multiplied by some weights and then goes through activation functions and then gets multiplied by some weights and then goes through activation and then finally gets multiplied by w2 um, but then there's a second part where it's j times psi of w0x and this j matrix because of this form as we have shown um, two slides ago um, this is actually max of w0x of zero and then concatenate it with zero at the bottom so basically um, by defining j this way and making it one part of the weight matrix w1 we have this part which does not get multiplied um, by any weight w1 so we directly bring um, the result of W0x forward to get activated and then to get multiplied by W2. So continuing, um, plugging in this result, we have y hat equals W2 psi of uh, W1 prime psi of W0x plus this max of W0x and 0 concatenated with 0. We can then kind of break, break up W2 into three parts. Okay, so then we, we kind of write down W2 in block form um, with W2 prime, W2 double prime, and then B2. So this is W2 multiplied by um, psi of what we're going to call Z2 in here. Okay. So now, um, what happens when the part, the normal, I guess the normal part of our weight matrix becomes all zero. Well, if this part becomes all zero, we still won't have any vanishing gradients. Um, and we can see that by plugging, plugging in zero over here. So this first part will all be zero, but then we still have the second part. So the second part will make it so that, okay, even though we have a zero, um, when we multiply things out, we are still gonna get W2 prime, B2 times Psi of W0 X. And then we can call this matrix W2 tilde. So when this part of the matrix becomes zero, then the only thing that is coming, um, that is going through Psi to get activate, uh, to get multiplied by W2 would be um, something from kind of something from the first layer. So that's what we have here. So this is something that we saw two slides ago as well.
um, I guess the main point here is that um, we can have one part of this weight matrix zero and then the other part um, will keep the singular value, uh, will basically be able to pass through um, the information from the first layer all the way to the last layer. Okay. So again, when W1 prime is all, is all zero, then we just collapse down to a two-layer multi-layer perceptron. So this can be trained more easily than a three-layer multi-layer perceptron. So in this case, even though the matrix uh, W1 prime is going to be zero, so the singular value of W1 prime transpose will be zero. Um, we still we don't we still don't have to worry about um, the singular value being small, and that's that's because. Um, when the singular value is small, we automatically get back to a, a multi-layer perceptron that is one layer smaller. So we kind of avoid the problem of having many layers of very small singular values in the weights. Okay, so then to summarize, um, our final model is going to be W2 psi of this whole thing. We have the first part, which is normal, and then the second part, which is kind of passes through um, W0 and X. To, uh, to the last layer. Okay, so here we're allowing the post activation. So this is kind of like H, right? We, we let it pass through a layer without being multiplied by the weight matrix. Okay, and then we add them directly to the pre-activations of the current layer. So this is one way of avoiding vanishing gradients. So when we have a layer of this form, um, we say that it consists of a residual connection from the post activations of the previous layer to the pre activations of the current layer. So the post activation refers to the H in here, and then the pre uh, passing it through to the pre activations of the current layer means that um, this part will still pass through the psi function before getting multiplied by W2. Okay, so more generally, so we have already seen that in the written notes as well, um, a residual connection can take the pre or post activations of an earlier layer and adding them to the pre or the post activations of a later layer. So writing down things more generally, so in the regular multi-layer perceptron, this is what we had, right? So y hat equals w big L h big L, and then each time we have h big L equals psi of z big L, and then all the z's are going to be equal to some weight times the previous h. So in the previous example, what we had was basically instead of zl equals wh, we have zl equals the normal wh part, but then adding the h from the previous layer concatenated with zero. So that's what we had before. So now written down more generally with any layer l. Um, so even more generally, we can make we can make this the left hand side ZL or HL, and the right hand side is still going to have this WH part, but then we can choose to add a previous H concatenated with zero, or a previous Z concatenated with zero. So this is depending on whether we want to pass through a previous post activation or a pre activation. In general, we can also pass this part through um, to a layer that is much later, so not just one layer later. So this is why we have the index L prime here instead of the L minus one, which is what we just saw. Okay, so a residual connection is a special case of a skip connection, which in general skips certain operations. Right, so in this case, we have something like HL prime skipping a matrix multiplication. So in the case that we have illustrated, we added this um, this part, which is skipping through the matrix multiplication to the normal uh, pre-activation. So in general, we can also concatenate the part that is skipping ahead rather than adding. And then we can do this to either the pre or post activation. Um, and also once we pass through the previous layer, we can also um, make it directly become HL or ZL, right? So it can be part of the pre or post activations uh, 
of, an, of a later layer. So the resulting model, strictly speaking, is actually no longer a multi-layer perceptron. Um, neural networks with this kind of passing through is known as a residual network. Um, sometimes people will also use the term residual network to, um, to talk about a particular neural network um, that is in popular use, that happens to have these structures. Okay, so the functional form of a neural network is known as an architecture. Um, in general, the architecture of a neural network defines how many layers there are, the number of units in a layer, the activation function, and what mathematical operations are performed in each layer. So some example for, um, in, uh, in multi-layer perceptron, for example, um, we're multiplying the previous layers post activations with a matrix and then passing it through some activation, right? So this is also known as a fully connected layer or a dense layer. Um, in the multi-layer perceptron, all the layers are fully connected or dense. Um, with residual networks, we can also um, use a fully connected layer with a skip connection from a previous layer. So this is one example of a, of a neural network with the uh, with some fully connected layers shown by these um, shown by these arrows, right? So th actually these are probably convolutional layers, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the point is that we have these normal operations, which are shown as the small arrows that are occurring, um, that are passing in information from one layer to the next. And then we have these long gray arrows, which depict um, the skip connections. So these are kind of like the residual structure in the network. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. So next time we're going to continue talking about some common architectures um, and that will wrap up the unit on neural networks. Um, we're going to proceed then to talk about classification. So have a good weekend and see you guys next time.